Too crowded, too overhyped, too expensive. Some Disney World restaurants have earned themselves quite an infamous reputation over the years. Should you really count them out of your trip just yet, or is adding them to your dining itinerary gonna surprise you in a really great way? We have got the full story here today. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. So Disney World is just as well known for their restaurants as they are for their rides, believe it or not. And while we do have a list of favorites that we love to hype up over and over again on this channel, there are also restaurants we've warned y'all to steer clear of, either because there's too much hype around them or because they've gone downhill or even because, plain and simple, the food just doesn't hold a candle to so many other awesome Disney World restaurants. But today, we're gonna round out the story a little bit. While the restaurants we're talking about today aren't exactly our go-tos, they can be just the right fit for you. So let's talk about what many folks have deemed the worst Disney World restaurants and why you might still wanna give them a chance regardless of their popularity. Before we get started, you know how I mentioned that we have a list of our favorite Disney World restaurants that we love to hype up? Yeah, that wasn't a figure of speech. We actually do have a list of our top 10 restaurants in each Disney World park, as well as Disney Springs, typed up and ready to send to your email. So make sure to scan the QR code you see on the screen or head to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash top restaurants after this to grab your free copy today. All right, let's dive into those worst restaurants. We are gonna start with one that's actually kind of hard to get a reservation for, Oga's Cantina over in Galaxy's Edge. This is a little somewhat discreet spaceport bar where their intergalactic spirits are plentiful and the Star Wars world building is impressive. Oga's Cantina has been a hotspot location for lots of guests since it first opened back in 2019, but even though reservations can sometimes be hard to come by for this one, it doesn't mean it's not without its downfalls. One of our biggest complaints about Oga's is just the crowds. So many people. Even with its limited capacity, this place is hopping all day long. More often than not, you're not gonna be seated in this lounge. Instead, you're gonna be led directly to the bar or to some standing table where there's standing room only and probably a bunch of other people at the same table and you'll have to enjoy your cocktails and mocktails while shoulder to shoulder with strangers. But you're not gonna be standing for too terribly long because Oga's isn't a place you're gonna be allowed to linger for the rest of the afternoon. In order to accommodate as many guests as possible, they do have a policy that you can hang out for 45 minutes and then peace out so that they can make way for another group. That being said, rarely are you ever gonna wanna hang out in here longer than 45 minutes because things can get pretty claustrophobic real quick. So that 45 minute mark is a good amount of time to drink a spirit or two while getting a good look at the place, which regardless of how busy it may be, is still really impressive to check out because you gotta go say hi to DJ Rex. He's working so hard over there in the corner of the room, pumping up the party. And while many of Disney's lounges and bars do have cocktails made on the spot upon your arrival, guaranteeing that they're fresh and maybe even modified to be exactly what you want, Oga's Cantina has such a quick turnaround that all the cocktails are pre-made, but pre-made doesn't mean they're bad. Oga's actually has some of the most unique cocktails on property, with fun drinks like the Bespin Fizz with its cloudy, glittery swirl, the Bloody Ranker with its ranker bone, AKA a bone-shaped meringue, and the all too popular Fuzzy Tauntaun with a buzz button foam that makes your lips go numb for a second, which is a really fun sensation that's pretty wild to try at least once. They've also got a lot of fun mocktails to try too, like the Blue Bantha with a vanilla butter sugar cookie on top and the Carbon Freeze with green apple popping pearls. But because these are pre-made drinks, means there's not a whole lot of changes you can make to them, if any. What you order is pretty much what you get, so for the most part, you're not gonna be able to ask for a drink to be made minus a certain ingredient, cause it's already pre-mixed to include that ingredient. Now, the biggest downfall for Oga's is definitely their food selection, because it's nearly non-existent. Again, several Disney World lounges have pretty expansive menus with lounge bites and appetizers, maybe even full-on entrees for you to choose from. You know about those, we talk about them over and over again, but at Oga's you can get Batu Bits, which is like a spacey trail mix, or the Hapabore Sampler Platter, which is their version of a charcuterie board, and that's it. Unless you count that jello shot as food and not a drink. Now, the Hapabore Sampler Platter may sound promising at first, and it's definitely better than it used to be, thanks to a few meat and cheese updates that have been made to it just recently, but it's definitely not gonna be the best charcuterie you'll have in the park. 
and yet it'll still be one of the most expensive options, priced at 22 bucks. If you need something to snack on while you're sipping on your cocktails, it's nice to know Ogus has something available, but if you're just coming here looking for a charcuterie board, you can find much better options and less expensive options even in Hollywood studios, like the California cheese and charcuterie plate at Baseline Tap House for 13 bucks, or the charcuterie from the Hollywood Brown Derby Restaurant Lounge, which is only $1 pricier than the one at Ogas, but it's gonna give you a better quality selection of cured meats, cheeses, and accompaniments since you'll be ordering it from a signature restaurant. Okay, let me let up on Ogas for a minute because I promise you despite the cons of this place, it's still a lounge worth visiting at least once. First of all, reservations aren't as hard to snag for Ogas as they used to be, especially if you avoid booking around the middle of the day when people are trying to escape the heat, even if just for 45 minutes. The cast members here also put on an incredible show. I've had a lot of fun conversations with my spaceport bartenders, which is impressive considering they're always kept super busy, but still manage to find the time to keep their guests immersed in this realm through witty banter and lots of Batu and lore. And here's a fun little tip for you. If you book a reservation toward the end of the night, as in the last time slot available, then when it's time for you to head out, you'll be exiting the park after it's closed, giving you the chance to walk through and maybe take a few super quick pictures of an empty galaxy's edge before you head out. And let me tell you, it is stunning. So at the end of the day, Oga's Cantina is one of those places you don't want to skip out on if you're a Star Wars fan because the upbeat vibes are fun and the cocktails are memorable. But don't be booking a reservation here if you absolutely hate being shoulder to shoulder with other guests in an already cramped area and or if you're trying to look for something substantial to eat. Oh, Tony's Town Square. You knew this was going to be on this video, right? I want to love Tony's Town Square in Magic Kingdom. I really, really want to love it because it's the only attraction throughout the parks that's themed around Lady and the Tramp, and I love that about it. But good theming doesn't overpower mediocre food, and Tony's Town Square can feel like a much more expensive version of Olive Garden with more salt, lots more salt, and to be honest, not as good food. And yet, while Tony's isn't going to hook you up with that all-you-can-eat pasta, salad, and breadsticks, it can still give you that hearty Italian-inspired fix you might have a hankering for during your Magic Kingdom day. And if that's what your family is really in the mood for, then Tony's will give you the satisfying basic Italian grub like spaghetti and fettuccine and shrimp scampi and chicken parmigiana. Oh, and I will admit that I absolutely adore eating the garlic bread for the table here, which is a toasted ciabatta with roasted garlic butter and Parmesan fonduta. While it might not be a free bread service, it's a bread service that could become the star of your entire meal. The bread is heavy on the garlic, not a problem for us, and the sauce is like a creamy Parmesan Alfredo sauce. Seriously, I could skip the entrees entirely and just stuff myself silly with the garlic bread. And maybe I will. After all, the menu is a la carte at Tony's, so if you just want to grab an appetizer as your full meal, you can do that, instead of being forced to pay for another appetizer, an entree, and dessert. Like you'd have to over at other Magic Kingdom table service restaurants like Be Our Guest Restaurant and Cinderella's Royal Table. Plus, reservations are relatively easy to make here, even as a last minute option. So if you don't make any advanced dining reservations for your Magic Kingdom day, but then decide you would really like to sit down and catch a break and get off your feet for a bit, you can check out the My Disney Experience app, tap on the dining tip board, and make a reservation for later on in the day over at Tony's. Plus, plus, if you do make a reservation here, try requesting a seat outside if it's not ungodly hot. While outdoor seating isn't always available upon request, it's nice to sit on the restaurant's patio where there are tables available since it'll give you a nice view of Main Street USA, which is great for people and parade watching. And plus, 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 if you time your Tony's visit just right, you might even be able to catch that Festival of Fantasy parade from your outdoor seat, which is kind of an ultra memorable experience. And my favorite time to sit outside at Tony's is on Halloween party nights because, you know, people can come in with their Halloween party ticket at four o'clock, which means you can sit there and watch all the awesome costumes come in. It's really, really fun people watching. Next up is Coral Reef Restaurant in Epcot, which is kind of confusing because we love it and we don't love it all at the same time. Coral Reef is very much a hit or miss table service restaurant. The prices for it seem to be going up, but the quality doesn't budge. While we've had decent meals here in the past, it's a seafood heavy location that has a hard time competing with better seafood places like a bunch of spots over in Disney Springs or even the Yorkshire County Fish Shop window at Epcot's UK Pavilion. But Coral Reef Restaurant can be the perfect fit for families, especially for families with younger children who just wanna sit down and eat a hearty meal in the AC. While Epcot has some really solid table service locations like La Cellier Steakhouse, Rose and Crown Dining Room, Spice Road Table, 
these aren't exactly the most entertaining environments for kids who tend to get squirmy after sitting in their high chairs for five to 10 minutes. However, Coral Reef Restaurant provides guests of all ages with endless entertainment because the main dining room is made up of a massive tank filled with all kinds of sea creatures, like thousands of them. So during your meal, you could see sharks and sea turtles and rays and maybe even divers getting ready to feed all of our fishy friends. And better yet, if you're interested in learning more about the creatures you see in these massive tanks, you can scan the QR code on your menu, which is going to lead you to a Coral Reef Restaurant spotting guide. This guide is filled with information on various creatures and is another great way for families to pass the time while waiting for their food. While the entrees here are mostly subpar, the entertainment is immense, literally and figuratively. Not to mention there are a few stellar appetizers and desserts and cocktail options on the menu that might help make up for the just okay mains, including the clam chowder, the Jack Daniels mousse, the pink London spritzer made with Liar's pink London spirit, grapefruit soda, pomegranate green tea, lime, and mint. Poor Pecos Bill. Pecos Bill Tall Tale Inn and Cafe over at Magic Kingdom has won us over and lost us and won us over again and lost us again. This is an up and down roller coaster ride relationship with this restaurant. Currently speaking, we're just not the biggest fans of this quick service for several reasons. The biggest change and most dramatic loss at Pecos Bill has definitely been the removal of that toppings bar. Years ago, the toppings bar included stuff like peppers and pickles, salsa, sauteed mushrooms, shredded cheese, lettuce, sliced tomatoes, even plastic cheese, plus many, many more fun and fresh options to help customize your entrees. Even an okay dish at Pecos Bill could turn into a top-notch one when you covered it in enough toppings. But after the pandemic, toppings bars became a thing of the past. Now, the former toppings bar is home to prepackaged basics like sugar, salt, and other items. No more salsa, no more pico, no more corn, definitely no more guacamole. Just the ho-hum stuff. That being said, you can still add select toppings upon request when making your order. For instance, when you're placing a mobile order, you can ask for things like lettuce or sour cream or salsa and other items, depending on what you're getting. Still no free guac, though. The toppings aren't nearly as extensive as they once were, but at least it's something. So how would I best describe the Pecos Bill we know and eat at today? It's kind of like a Disney-fied Taco Bell, like nachos, tacos, rice bowls. Now, there used to be some more unique items on the menu, like onion ring baskets and taco salads, chili cheese fries, chicken enchilada soup, and sopapillas. There was even once a Nachos Rio Grande challenge on a secret menu where you could order a massive gargantuan plate of nachos for $90. And that $90 would not only be more than enough food to feed your whole family, but you'd also get a table that had been all dolled up with pictures of your drinks of choice and a processional with cow bells and cheers. Once you conquered the challenge, you were treated to a fun ceremony featuring the Pecos to the West, an official certificate, cowboy hats, and sheriff badges. Sadly, this fun show ended in 2017 and nothing really replaced it. Don't get me wrong, I don't hate Pecos Bill. It's still a good option for those looking for an affordable quick meal with familiar flavors inside Magic Kingdom. Plus, the seating area is absolutely huge, so there's always some place to sit. And hey, a taco trio for 11 bucks, that's pretty reasonable in a Disney park. But it's no longer a quick service we get excited to visit. It's more like a place that'll get the job done and get you fed on a budget, but isn't gonna be super duper memorable by any means. Then again, if you get that $1 queso, you can automatically improve any of these mid-tier meals because according to the AJ laws of food, cheese can fix pretty much anything. So you can run, but you can't hide from Starbucks, not even in Disney World. Each Disney World park has a location that serves your classic Starbucks items. At Hollywood Studios, it's Trolley Car Cafe. At Animal Kingdom, it's Creature Comforts. At Magic Kingdom, it's Main Street Bakery. And at Epcot, it's Connections Cafe. If you've been following this channel for a while now, then you already know my thoughts about grabbing Starbucks in the parks. These locations can be major time sucks at the very start of your day because so many guests gravitate toward them first before hitting up any other rides. So you can wind up missing some of the shortest cues of the day just because you're standing in line for a vanilla latte that you could get back home. That being said, I'm not telling you to avoid it completely because even though the majority of their menus are made up of the familiar stuff, they also have some exclusive treats specific to each location sometimes. For example, in the past, Trolley Car Cafe has offered up some of our favorite cupcakes like the Earl Grey Cupcake and the Butterfinger Chocolate Peanut Butter Crunch Cupcake. These switch up often, so you'll have to check and see what's going to be available during your next visit. At Creature Comforts, the limited time pastries have also dressed to impress on multiple occasions. Just this past year, we got to try the It's Tough to Be a Bug Brownie with the cutest ice 
missing we've ever witnessed, aka Heimlich the Caterpillar with his big old bug eyes and squishy body. And if we hadn't stopped by Creature Comforts during our day at Animal Kingdom, we would have missed out on this fudgy beauty entirely because that was the only place you could get him. At Main Street Bakery, we've gotten to chow down on tons of exclusive desserts, plus a full-on chicken strip club entree that's created a rather satisfying lunch during our Magic Kingdom day for just around $11. And at Connections Cafe, you're going to stumble into those liege waffles. Liege waffles themed around current Epcot festivals and holidays, just lots of liege waffles. Like I said, the Starbucks locations aren't something you're going to want to turn away from and never look back because they could be offering a fun and unique treat that you don't want to miss. Just be careful not to make these bakeries the first spot you hit up in the morning, otherwise you might find yourself waiting for a snack and drink just as long, if not longer, then you'd have to wait for some of those park rides. Instead of hitting up Starbucks in the morning for your Java fix, try one of the Joffrey's kiosks or search and see if one of the quick services inside the park has hot coffees and cold brews available for purchase first thing in the morning. These quick services will not only have much shorter lines at the start of the day, but they'll also have the mobile order option available via the My Disney Experience app, which the Starbucks locations are lacking inside the parks. Thunderstorms, dinosaurs, and talking trees. You'd think Rainforest Cafe and T-Rex would be top priority restaurants for your next trip, just based off their dining rooms alone. But there are lots of reasons why we tend to put these two restaurants at the bottom of our priority list each time we visit. For starters, Rainforest Cafe and T-Rex are part of a chain of restaurants owned by Landry's. And while T-Rex has dwindled down its locations over the years, Rainforest has over 20 other stores across the US with one location in Canada too. So it's not exactly the most unique experience to the Disney World area. However, this could also play in your favor if you're part of the Landry's Select Club loyalty program, which is gonna allow you to spend and use rewards at Landry's own locations, including our rainforest and prehistoric friends over there. You may want to check out this program before your trip just in case you can get a meal at Rainforest or T-Rex for a discounted price or potentially get priority seating through that Landry's Select Club situation. Then there's the food quality we need to talk about, which I'd put on the same level as like an Applebee's or Chili's. But these Disney locations are going to have way pricier food since what you're really paying for here is the experience. And finally, while these restaurants are a ton of fun for lots of kids, some kids might find them to be intimidating. They can get very loud and you could also be seated right next to an animal that's four times your size. So as immersive as these dining experiences can be, they can also be a little too immersive for some, leading to an over stimulating meal. And yet, even though these restaurants can be kitschy and expensive and noisy, they can still be a really good time. It's like the quintessential tourist trap experience, which might be just the vibe you're looking for. Not only that, but despite the basic entrees and apps available on the menu that aren't mind-blowing or anything, the menus are, at very least, expansive, so there's plenty of different options to satisfy a lot of different preferences. At the end of the day, it just depends on what your group is going to get a kick out of, and if an okay meal is worth it for some thunderstorms and dino rific interactions, then great! Not to mention, while I'm not always the biggest fan of Disney World's table service desserts, the sparkling volcano brownie dessert at Rainforest Cafe or the chocolate extinction at T-Rex are crowd pleasers and can serve up to four or more folks in your party. They're basic, but they're good. Now, some folks love those restaurants where music is popping and the conversations get loud, but I am not a huge fan personally of some of those, and if you aren't either, then you'll probably agree with me in my thoughts about STK Orlando and Planet Hollywood inside Disney Springs. STK Orlando is another chain restaurant that's basically a modern twist on a traditional American steakhouse. Meanwhile, Planet Hollywood is that large dome you're gonna see over on the west side of the shopping district with multiple dining room levels that each have tons and tons and tons of movie memorabilia, like legit stuff, the real stuff. And hey, those descriptions might have been enough to sell you on both places. STK turns more into a party scene as the evening progresses where the lights are turned down and the music is turned up and dancing is encouraged. And then there's Planet Hollywood, which feels like walking through a museum just made for all the cinephiles out there. But for me, both of these restaurants have two key downfalls. First, they're way too loud. Okay, so STK is actually not as loud during lunchtime, but once it switches over to that club-like setting for dinner, it's like you gotta scream to hear the people sitting right next to you. And as far as Planet Hollywood goes, it's just loud all the time, constantly. I've never been when it wasn't loud. Not a great place to take the little ones in your group, especially if you're hoping they'll take a quick nap during your meal. And secondly, the high-priced menus at both locations are a little overzealous. STK is a signature restaurant location, meaning if you're going to be using the Disney Dining Plan next year, this restaurant will require you to use two of your table service credits. Two. 
Sure, the food's pretty good, but if you're trying to pick someplace nice to dine with your Disney dining plan inside Disney Springs, you've still got options like Morimoto Asia and the Boathouse and Haleo to choose from. STK, on the other hand, can feel a little too amped up for a fancy night out and probably won't be a huge hit with your kids or anyone in your family that you want to have a conversation with. Now, to be fair though, the food is really good. I know I already said that, but it is. It's good steak. Planet Hollywood may not be a signature restaurant, but the prices are still pretty steep for the quality you're served here, which is like TGI Friday's kind of food. I get it, the title of this video is the worst places you should still try, so let's get to the why we should still try this part. <laughs> Here's my advice to you. If you're gonna eat at STK, don't choose dinner and don't choose the main dining room. Instead, go to the STK lounge during their social hour, because you're gonna be able to order so many different lounge bites straight from the STK kitchen for a way cheaper price point. Also, you can ask to sit up on the second level. They've got a great kind of outdoor rooftop bar up there. Now, if you do decide on the lounge, you can get things like Wagyu meatballs for six bucks, short rib quesadillas for six bucks, STK and frites for nine dollars. This is literally the cheapest you're going to see STK. Just to put it in perspective for you, even a side of mac and cheese during lunch and dinner can be 19 bucks just for a little side of macaroni. So if you want to check STK Orlando off your bucket list, just to say you did it, Social Hour could actually make this normally high-end place worth your time and money. As for Hollywood, while the eats here aren't going to be mind-blowingly spectacular, it's not a bad option if you're trying to cater to a lot of different palettes. The Planet Hollywood menu is very expansive, with options as light as spinach and berry salads or as hearty as the bacon mac and cheese burger. Not to mention, if you just wanted to make reservations to see all the movie props, but you didn't want to eat a full meal here, you can always get some appetizers to split amongst your group and call it good, since Planet Hollywood is a la carte, meaning you can eat however you want without worrying about any prefix menu. You may even want to go with the High Roller Sampler, which will hook you up with the world-famous Chicken Crunch Chicken Tenders, Texas Tostadas, Buffalo Wings, Five Cheese Dip, and Fried Jumbo Shrimp. This sampler is big enough to split among a family of four, and the price is around 43 bucks. Oh, it also comes out in a serving mechanism that's shaped like a Ferris wheel, which is a whole bunch of fun for the kids. All right, it's time to talk about Puffy Pizza. You know we love it, except we love to hate it. Pizza Safari in Animal Kingdom and Pizza Rizzo in Hollywood Studios both have something in common. They sell that puffy personal pizza you love to hate or hate to love. In the last point, I mentioned that there are several steakhouses in Disney World, with some being more worthy of your time and money than others. And the same thing can be said about Disney's pizza. There are a plethora of pizza places around the Disney scene, and some of those places have high-quality pizza that you're going to be dreaming about long after you take that last cheesy bite. Pizza Safari and Pizza Rizzo, though, not those kinds of pizza places. The kind of pizza served here is like 10% sauce, 5% cheese, 5% toppings, 30% grease, and 50% dough. And that all together actually does make 100% mediocre pizza. And yet, I can't help myself. I root for these little quick service pizza places anyways. Not only do they both have fun dining room themes with Pizza Fari featuring multiple areas with colorful animal murals and Pizza Rizzo being inspired by the beloved Muppets crew, but those pizzas are still probably going to be well-loved by your kids. After all, it's still bread, sauce, and cheese. So even if it's not the highest quality pizza you're going to find, it's pizza. And it's more affordable pizza at that, with a kid's pepperoni pizza priced at around 8 bucks, and adult pizzas at about 11 to 12 So if you're looking for something fast and easy that you know your picky eaters are going to enjoy, Pizza Fari and Pizza Rizzo could still be your go-to options. And if you're not wanting to join your kids for a puffy pizza party, both quick services do have other options you might prefer, like the meatball sub from Pizza Rizzo and the chicken parmesan sandwich from Pizza Fari. Now, if you want to check out all the different restaurants, as in every single one of them, available for you to eat at Disney World during your upcoming vacation, the DFB team and I spend hundreds of hours writing brand new guides and updating them with all the most current Disney dining information. They're packed with our five-step Disney World vacation planning process, extensive information on quick and table services, budgeting tips, daily itineraries, tons of recommendations, and more, and they are all available for you. So be sure to check out our snack and festival and dining guides over at dfbstore.com and type in code YouTube to save some money on your total purchase. Remember, these books are 100% money back guaranteed. Okay, we're headed into Be Our Guest Restaurant. I uh, still hate putting this one on a list featuring the worst of Disney dining, but considering the food has gotten so expensive without improving the quality any, 
It's not our favorite place to dine right now. Be Our Guest is one of the most expensive restaurants you're going to find in Magic Kingdom, which is saying something when you've got those princesses over there. And lunch and dinner feature a prefix menu, which includes one entree, appetizer, and dessert for $70 per adult and $41 per kid. That's really expensive. While the food isn't terrible, it also isn't $70 worthy, especially when you consider the fact that this very same restaurant back when it first opened used to be a quick service experience for lunch and a really, really good one at that. I remember coming back here in 2012 and ordering a prime roast beef sandwich for just over $12. 12, and now here we are, 58 plus dollars later and the appeal of this once magical location just feels less and less appealing by the additional dollar. Here's the thing, there is no ignoring the fact that the dining rooms are drop dead gorgeous here and if you have any Beauty and the Beast fans in your family who do anything to dine inside the Beast Castle then of course you have to go here. You're going to want to make a reservation just for the atmosphere alone. But if you're thinking that $70 price tag means you're going to get super high quality food, like you'll receive at other high-end signature table service restaurants like California Grill or Gico or Monsieur Paul, you're going to end up being really disappointed. So what food do we like getting at Be Our Guest? While the quality still might not live up to the hype of the price point, the French onion soup is satisfyingly cheesy and savory, and the dessert trio gives you the chance to try three desserts, one of which is topped with the famous gray stuff rumored to be delicious by a certain candlestick. That being said, the gray stuff can also be found at a much cheaper price point over at Gaston's Tavern just a few steps away from Be Our Guest via the gray stuff cupcake for under six bucks. As far as entrees go, as long as you're paying that super steep price point, might as well go big or go home with the filet mignon, which comes with smashed potato, haricot vert, and sauce a pois. Heading back over to quick service, let's go to the value resort food courts. Now the food courts at your value resort like Pop Century, Art of Animation, All Stars, might not hook you up with the best food ever. And yeah, they're definitely not as adventurous as they used to be, especially landscape of flavors over at Art of Animation. That really has taken a dive in terms of variety. And remember when world premiere Food Court at All-Star Movies had that ridiculously fun secret menu based off items you could see on an old school viewfinder? It was so fun. But that being said, there are still four solid reasons that your Value Resorts Food Court could end up being one of your favorite places to eat in Disney World. Reason one, they provide you with so many different options across several different windows. You got things like pizza and pasta, burgers, chicken, sandwiches, salads, and bakery items. They even serve up select seasonal offerings to spice up their menus and cater to the more adventurous eaters in your party. Reason two, they stay open pretty late. So even if you didn't get a chance to have dinner at the park before closing time, the food courts are open till 11 p.m. So late night eaters, you can get something too. Reason three, they're open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they even have tacho breakfast bowls now, which are tater tots topped with scrambled eggs and cheddar, sausage gravy, and bacon. That's delicious. And reason four, entree prices are gonna be more reasonable than other Disney restaurants out there with adult meals typically costing around 10 to 13 bucks and kids meals around seven to nine. Am I saying these food courts are worth going out of your way to try? No, but they are worth taking advantage of if you're already staying as a guest at one of these resorts. Now, while each of these restaurants have major flaws with some having more glaring errors than others, keep in mind that everyone's dining experiences and preferences are gonna be different, which is why you need to keep tuning back in with us as we continue to feature different Disney restaurants and we keep going back to all these restaurants over and over and over again, because you know what? Some of them change. We have some that would be on this list last year, but they're not on this list this year and vice versa. Because menus change and chefs change and service can change too. And it can make a big difference in how that restaurant appeals to you. So it's our job to help you figure out which restaurants are gonna be the right ones for you, whether they universally get five stars or not. Cause you know what? Every restaurant is right for somebody. So I really appreciate you taking your time to stick with us through this video. It's a tough one, I know. But don't forget, we've got our top 10 restaurants guide for each of the parks and Disney Springs available for you to pick up for free over at DisneyFoodBlog.com slash top restaurants. Just drop us your name and email and we'll get that PDF sent to your inbox faster than you can say, don't believe me, ask the dishes. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.